Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Jeff Feynman. Dr. Feynman is Professor of Pediatrics at the University of California in San Francisco and Chief of Pediatric Critical Care at the Benioff Children's Hospital in San Francisco. Jeff, welcome. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and part of, be part of such a tremendous forum that you have here. Uh, Jeff, you are uh, widely considered to be one of the uh, most focused researchers in the field of pulmonary hypertension in our field of pediatric critical care. You've lectured all over the country and indeed all over the world on this. And uh, many of my colleagues are undoubtedly wondering, you know, how can we think about pulmonary hypertension? Um, you know, what are the latest thoughts about uh, the state of the research and how we approach patients at the bedside? And so I'll begin simply by saying, you know, where do we begin? You know, how do you think about pulmonary hypertension? Well, Dr. Burns, as you know, this is a, a it's a complex disease. It can be a disease that's the primary problem or it could be associated with many other disorders. Some of them we're just figuring out. And so it's, it's complicated because it crosses over many different disciplines and probably the pathobiology is quite diverse. And then Within pediatrics, it really brings up some special circumstances that really aren't reflected in the adult population. So I think we have to kind of readdress, reconsider some of the fundamental things that we think about with pulmonary hypertension. So for example, let's start with the definition. So the definition is a hemodynamic definition, even though it's a structural and functional disease of the pulmonary vasculature and ultimately the right heart. We have a hemodynamic definition, which is mean pulmonary arterial pressure of greater or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury at rest or 30 millimeters of mercury during exercise and a calculated pulmonary vascular resistance of three woods units or greater. So unfortunately that definition may work reasonably well for the adult population but there are several circumstances where it doesn't really adequately characterize the disease in the pediatric population. One most notably would be patients with single ventricular heart disease where, as you know, since they ultimately go on to have a passive pulmonary blood flow system, any modest elevation in pulmonary vascular resistance can have a profound clinical impact on their outcome and potential sur surgical candidacy. So we really have to rethink that. So we're even rethinking the name, in fact. Instead of pulmonary hypertension, we're often thinking about it now as pulmonary hypertensive vascular disease without this strict definition that's re re related to hemodynamic parameters. The other thing is, you know, it's pulmonary vascular resistance and the adult population tends not to index the cardiac output to body surface area, where in pediatrics we do. So a PVRI or an indexed pulmonary vascular resistance can be quite different than a non-indexed, particularly in our teenagers, where the weights may be the same as an adult, but we're indexing it and they're not. So I think we have to start with the definition and really rethink how it relates to pediatrics. So we're getting away from that catch-all phrase of pulmonary hypertension and really talking more about pulmonary hypertensive vascular disease. Well, Jeff, I, I have to confess I'm glad to hear uh, a reconceptualization of this because it's never made sense to me that a three-year-old, a 30-year-old, and a 60-year-old all had the same diagnostic criteria and, and it just intuitively didn't make right. sense and I can't think of any other parallel in our field of pediatric critical care where we anchored an adult definition to uh, uh, an infant or a child. Um, but if that's the case, then what is the classification scheme that we should be thinking about for these pulmonary hypertensive vascular disorders? That's an excellent point. So. There is an adult classification that was modified in 2013 in a conference in Nice, and it certainly is getting better than what it was in terms of um, incorporating the pediatric world. For example, the portion of related to congenital heart disease is much better. As you can see, there are, there, it's classified in five groups, with the first one being pulmonary arterial hypertension, with the major group being the idiopathic or what we would call primary pulmonary hypertensions, both hereditable and non-hereditable. But within that group as well is a big subpopulation of the pediatric uh, pulmonary vascular disease, which would be congenital heart disease. And in addition, there's also persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn 
which as you know is vastly different um, than the, the disease related to congenital heart disease. The second uh, subgroup is pulmonary hypertension due to left uh, heart disease um, with subset of having congenital deficits, defects in that. The third group is pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease and or hypoxia. So within the pediatric world, the emerging group of patients with um, chronic lung disease and bronchopulmonary dysplasia could be characterized in that group. And the fourth group is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And then the fifth group is pulmonary hypertension with unclear or multifactorial mechanisms. So that's what we have to work with from an adult um, classification perspective. Let me show the next slide, which, which does show you an improved classification with the subset related to congenital heart disease. So in terms of the updated classification of pulmonary arterial hypertension associated with congenital heart disease, you can see that there is now four subtypes. The Eisenmenger syndrome, those with left to right shunts, both correctable and non-correctable, pulmonary arterial hypertension with coincidental congenital heart disease, which is an interesting um, subpopulation, and those with post-operative pulmonary arterial hypertension, those with congenital heart disease that was repaired but then go on to have a pulmonary arterial hypertension that's progressive. However, as you can see, this really falls short when we're talking about classifying pediatric pulmonary vascular disease because it really doesn't take into account a multitude of issues related primarily to pediatrics. That being some of these subsets of patients have chromosomal or genetic syndromes associated with their disease. There's obviously developmental abnormalities and with a lung hypoplasia being a major one. That's a significant population. Other multifactorial conditions. And then probably most importantly, it fails to take into account pathological insults in the growing lung, whether it be in utero aberrations and postnatally. As, as you know, the, the lung can be insulted postnatally and then fail to grow adequately. And so my colleagues got together a few years ago at the Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute meeting in Panama, and a task force was put together. And it's an ongoing task force, but we put together a modified classification for pediatrics that really starts to get at some of these more developmental-based um, problems. So you can see there's 10 major categories. The first is prenatal or developmental pulmonary hypertensive vascular disorders. A subset of PPHN may be incorporated into that category. There's a perinatal pulmonary vascular maladaption, which is another subset of persistent pulmonary hypertension in newborn. Pediatric cardiovascular disease, which incorporates the congenital and acquired heart disease. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia, isolated pediatric pulmonary hypertensive vascular disease or isolated pediatric pulmonary arterial hypertension, which would take place of the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Multifactorial pulmonary hypertensive vascular disease and congenital malformation syndromes. Pediatric lung disease, pediatric thromboembolic disease, pediatric hypobaric hypoxic exposure, and the last one, pediatric pulmonary vascular disease associated with other systemic disorders. So as you can see, this gets much closer to really adequately classifying pediatric pulmonary vascular disorders. And I think it's important for many reasons in terms of when we're doing characterizing the pathobiology of this, these disorders and going on to clinical trials, you really want to try to separate the different types of pulmonary vascular disease. So Jeff, that's a very helpful overview as to where we are in that new classification scheme. But could I press you on that a little bit? Um, we often hear about these expert consensus groups and come up with a new classification scheme. And, you know, candidly, what is the importance of that? Is this going to change in two or three years? Where, where does that take us? Why is, why is this scheme uh, important? Well, I think it'll, it'll continue to be modified and improved upon, but I think it's important, one, to just collect the epidemiologic data, which is a moving target and evolving, because as I alluded to earlier, I think we're starting to appreciate more and more vascular disease associated with other disease states, which, which we hadn't really appreciated well before, bronchopulmonary dysplasia being an excellent um, example of that.
Um, so one, just to, to understand the epidemiology of the pediatric disease is important. I think the classification helps with that. And then hopefully as we go on to clinical trials, I think it will be important to, to randomize or study patients within groups to see if different therapies can help different groups. We'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. Could you first uh, write your city and country that you're located in? And the question is this, utilizing the framework and classification scheme that Dr. Feynman has just presented here, could you list the top three causes of pulmonary hypertension in your pediatric population? We're back now with uh, Dr. Jeff Feynman. Jeff, um, you know, the next question becomes, uh, moving into you know treatment, We've, we're past classification. How do you think about um, organizing uh, your team in San Francisco um, to approach uh, a comprehensive treatment plan on these patients? Well, I think it's very important that we have a team that's that's multidisciplinary. As you know, pulmonary, pediatric pulmonary vascular disease reaches across a broad spectrum of subspecialties and and various subspecialties specialists will, will see these patients, whether they realize it or not. And I, I think the best way to do it is with a collaborative multidisciplinary team. Um, certainly a cardiologist is paramount to, to this group, and having someone who does cardiac catheterization as, um, is very, very important and, and be able to do interventions. We also have um, a pulmonologist who helps us, particularly with the patients with uh, lung disease. And we have a neonatologist who helps us with many of the neonatal disorders and the lung hypoplasia disorders, in general diaphragmatic coronaries, for example. Um, I'm an ICU doctor, so I tend to focus on more of the inpatient management, particularly the acute inpatient management. And then, as you know, they're complex patients, and they require a lot of care. And they have a disease that often is a chronic disease with no real um, cure in sight. So having social work support, um, great nursing support, I think also as part of the team, you need to have collaborative pediatric surgeons and ultimately transplant surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons. And then you, you have to have your other subspecialists that may run into these patients, like the hematologists, for example, the rheumatologists, for example. I think that we need, they need to be educated and, and be part of the group. And so that they'll send patients for screening when appropriate. And then, as you know, this is a not only a complex disease, but it can be a devastating chronic disease with not, although our therapies have certainly in, improved survival, there's no real cure in sight. And so there needs to be a lot of support systems for these patients. And we like to set up the clinic where there's, we have a social worker, a nutritionist, a pharmacist that are all focused on these particular patients. And the clinic is within our cardiopulmonary clinic, so we really try to organize it so they'll have one visit and, and the subspecialists go to them. We'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. Could you first state your city and country location? And the question is, in your program, are patients with pulmonary hypertension managed by a pulmonary hypertension service or team or are they managed by uh, an individual specialist? If an individual specialist, which specialty typically manages those patients at your center? So Jeff, one of the questions um, that often arises is, how would you characterize um, the most significant advances in, in treatment over the last 25 years? What were the key breakthroughs and what steps? Well, I think from a pathobiological standpoint, our, our understanding of endothelial pathology as being a significant contributor to the disease has led to many endothelial-based therapies. And I think that's really been a, the most exciting uh, component of the, of the field. And if you look at it 
the timeline of FDA-approved medications, and unfortunately I'm talking about adult-approved medications, there's really been a substantial increase in the number of different medications that have been approved to treat pulmonary vascular disease. Having said that, I think that we are really barbaric in the way we approach the therapy to this disease in the sense that it's clearly a spectrum of disease with multiple etiology and probably multiple um, pathobiological cascades being affected. And right now, it's, I'd say it's similar to an analogy of maybe 30 or 40 years ago when a patient had cancer, you would say, you have cancer and we have five drugs and we'll give you one or we may add a second or we may add a third without really understanding the biology of that particular cancer and then targeting the therapy. And obviously our onco oncology colleagues have gone, done a spectacular job of, of characterizing the different cancers and the targeted therapies. I think that's, that's where we are back there in the pulmonary hypertension therapeutic um, realm in the sense that we have certain we can go we have certain therapeutic targets but we utilize them all for all the patients and we just don't understand enough about the pathobiology of each different disease within a particular patient and we don't have markers to try to even start to characterize that and so we cannot target our therapies Having said that, it's really been very exciting in terms of the, the additional therapies that, that we have that have clearly changed this disease. I mean, the overall survival is, is much, much better than it, than it was 10 years ago. And the, our ability to treat them with transitions from intravenous to subcutaneous where you don't need an indwelling catheter and the risks of infection or thrombosis, and now oral agents that are coming along that really have changed or improving the lifestyle of our patients. The next slide shows a timeline of the different therapies that have been proved, approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for pulmonary vascular disease. As you can see, in 1995, all we really had was calcium channel blockers, anticoagulants, digoxin and diuretics. And we still use some of those today. In 1995 was really the first drug, epoprostenol or Flolan, that was approved for pulmonary hypertension. And it, as you know, it's a prostacyclin as, it's, as seen in green. And it had to be given continuously intravenously. Then there was a gap of six years until we got a new class of drugs, the endothelin receptor antagonists with bosantin being the first one. Tropostanol, which is another prostanoid but has a longer half-life than Folan and is given subcutaneously and it's also stable at room temperature. So this made the delivery of prostanoids much simpler and 2002 it was approved. And in 2004 the IV formulation was approved as well as the inhaled uh, prostanoid Iloprost. Sildenafil, which again is the third classification of drug, a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, was approved in 2005. Then there have been some additional um, endothelial receptor antagonists with embrisantin in 2007. And then more recently, 2013, Masitantan uh, was approved. But then inhaled tripostanil or uh, Tyvesa was approved, which is a longer acting inhaled prostanoid formulation. And then to Dalafil, a longer acting uh, phosphodiesterase 5 medication. And then, and lastly, in 2013, in addition to the new endothelin receptor antagonist, we have Riosiquat, which is a soluble guanylate cyclase activator, a new or fourth class of drug. And then a very exciting drug, an oral triprostanol or oral remodulin, which is an oral prostanoid. And that could replace, if shown to be a as efficacious, the subcutaneous or intravenous route of prostanoid administration. Jeff, that's a wonderful overview of uh, some of the most uh, significant uh, breakthroughs, at least as um, licensed by the FDA for adults, as you noted. In pediatrics, um, I well remember the early 90s uh, when nitric oxide 
was being used in an investigational sense. Could you take us through the story of nitric oxide, um, and in particular, nitric oxide in our field of pediatrics? Sure, and nitric oxide, as you know, is the only approved therapy for children. It's approved for neonates with hypoxemic respiratory failure. That whole other slide of therapies is just approved for adults. This, so the nitric oxide stories is one that's near and dear to, to our hearts because it's so rare for, for a medication to be approved primarily for a pediatric, let alone a neonatal indication. The whole nitric oxide story is extremely um, interesting and exciting because as you know, it was a molecule that was found in, to be produced endogenously by the vessels, by the endothelial cells. And not only is it just a therapy, but it's, it's clearly aberrations in the nitric oxide system are perturbed in pulmonary vascular disease. So it can almost be considered like a replacement therapy. Throughout the years, our, our, our approach to lowering the pulmonary vascular resistance was always to try to dilate the pulmonary vasculature. And oxygen was really the only one that we could utilize that dilated the pulmonary vasculature without dilating the systemic vasculature and resulting in systemic hypotension. And we used, as you know, many, many drugs that dilated both the pulmonary vasculature, but they were always limited by the systemic hypotension that they created. So there was always this search for the panacea, the selective pulmonary vasodilator. And really nitric oxide filled that bill to, to, to some extent. The nitric oxide, the gas, has been around for a long time. And you could find it in um, any anesthesia gas catalog. It's in a tank and it was been used for many decades in diffusion capacity studies. And as you know, uh, anesthesiologists in this town um, thought about the, co the concept of delivering it as, an, as its natural gas inhalationally uh, as a selective, potentially selective vasodilator because once it hits the bloodstream, it avidly binds with hemoglobin and then is inactivated. You're referring to the early work of Warren Zabel at the Massachusetts General Hospital. That's correct, that's correct. Now there was always the concern um, of nitrogen dioxide, which is clearly toxic to the lungs. And so if nitric oxide sat around or was exposed to oxygen, it would avidly form nitrogen dioxide. So I think the work was held up by this fear of, of pulmonary toxicity, but it was related to nitrogen dioxide as opposed to the pure nitric oxide gas. And they showed initially in animal studies um, that it actually produces very potent pulmonary vasodilation and is selective. And then um, in, in modest doses, it was safe. And then as you know, um, people at Boston Children's Hospital, David Wessel, um, studied it predominantly in the um, congenital heart disease population for post-operative pulmonary hypertension. And they showed very nicely that it was a very potent and selective pulmonary vasodilator and has really become our mainstay of acute pulmonary hypertensive therapies in the ICU setting. The neonatologists got together and there were several studies, that multi-centered studies that were done and they showed not only safety but efficacy in the about a 30% reduction in the need for extracorporeal life support in neonates with hypoxemic respiratory failure. And it was for that indication that the Food and Drug Administration approved and held nitric oxide. Uh, Jeff, can I ask you a question about nitric oxide therapy uh, uh, outside of that category of uh, the newborn? At our center, um, it's often the case that you have an older child who uh, may have ARDS and is approaching terminal hypoxemia. And uh, not infrequently, uh, the clinicians um, will uh, often in the middle of the night add in nitric oxide and sure enough, there'll be a transient benefit right. in the uh, AA gradient, undoubtedly because of the VQ matching. Uh, but uh, you know, when the uh, team comes back in the morning, typically the more senior staff will say, you know, it, the saturations went up, but the studies clearly show it doesn't work in this case. Um, 
are there individual cases where you use it as a rescue therapy, uh, despite the fact that all of the controlled studies in adults and children haven't demonstrated a significant long-term improvement in outcomes? Are there individual cases where you use it as a rescue therapy uh, for terminal hypoxemia? It's an excellent question. So as you know, there, there are two primary effects related to its vasodilation that you can lower pulmonary arterial pressure and vascular resistance and therefore unload the right ventricle. But you can also improve ventilation perfusion mismatch and get improvement in oxygenation. As you point out, and the studies have really been very consistent that it, the improvement is quite transient and by 24 hours it's gone, which is interesting and the mechanisms of that are unclear. I would argue that in subsets of patients where pulmonary hypertension associated with the lung injury is significant, such that the right ventricle is struggling, that in that case, using nitric oxide in doses that promote significant pulmonary vasodilation could potentially um, help individual patients. So although those studies don't select for the patients that have associated pulmonary hypertension related to the lung injury, I would argue that that would be a study that's worth doing, where you take a population of patients where there's significant pulmonary hypertension associated with their acute lung injury and, and, and see if it helps them. So in answer to your question, I do use it in subsets of patients, particularly where we think either clinically or echocardiographically, the right heart may be struggling and that there's elevated pulmonary arterial pressure. Can I push you a little more? Do you, um, do you routinely use transthoracic echo to first demonstrate that you have right ventricular dysfunction and clear evidence of uh, right ventricular failure in the setting of pulmonary hypertension and then look at it again to see if there's a dose response? Or are you willing to sometimes do it, as you suggested as well, uh, just based on clinical impression? Generally, what I do is I, I would get a B-type natriuretic peptide um, level, plasma level, and see if it's elevated. Because if it's normal, I think the chances of there being any right ventricular dysfunction are minimal. If it's elevated, then I'd ask my cardiology colleagues to do a transthoracic echo. And if there's evidence of elevated pulmonary arterial pressure, then I would utilize nitric oxide. Interesting. Um, well, that you know leads, uh, I, I think, to the next question that I um, I don't doubt that many colleagues are wondering, and I'm wondering myself. Um, when you're in the ICU in San Francisco and you face a patient with an acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, uh, take us through the escalation of therapy um, that you're thinking about. You know, what are you starting first? Uh, what are you going to add on? Um, what are the adjunct therapies? When are you going to consider uh, a diagnostic tests such as a cath? Um, when would you not consider a cath for fear that that could be a precipitating event? Um, can you take us through your therapy? Sure. I think the, f the first important issue is, toward, in terms of the approach, is the recognition of that this is a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. And that may or may not be obvious. So as you know, some children with pulmonary hypertensive crises, they can develop very severe bronchoconstriction, whether it's related to, to proximal compression of the airways from an acutely dilated pulmonary artery or distal bronchoconstriction or both. But you can be called to the bedside and a patient's chest, assuming they were on the ventilator, is not moving. So the assessment then, as you know, is, is the tube out, is the tube plugged, or is this a pulmonary hypertensive crisis? And, you know, that is a, can be a very challenging assessment at the bedside, and you want to be right, because if it's a pulmonary hypertensive crisis, you really don't want to waste time dealing with an airway that's actually fine, but you really have to try to make that assessment. So knowing the patient, knowing the history, knowing the risk of them developing acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis is important when you get to the bedside. In, in terms of recognition, I think it's important that we understand the pathophysiology of an acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis. I think that's uh, well delineated in this next slide. So as you can see, there's some inciting event. And in the ICU setting, it's often hypoxia, acidosis, or agitation. 
And that, those inciting events result in an increase in pulmonary arterial pressure, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And as we know, patients with significant pulmonary vascular disease can have an exaggerated vasoconstricting response to these stimuli. So you get a massive increase in resistance. And what makes it a pulmonary hypertensive crisis is that the right ventricle fails. So the right ventricle will fail and dilate, and you end up with an increase in right ventricular and diastolic pressure and volume. And this by itself can result in ischemia and related dysrhythmias. Importantly, it can cause septal shift and a decrease in left ventricular and diastolic volume, a decrease in cardiac output, and metabolic acidosis, which can further uh, aggravate the pulmonary vasoconstriction. That, as you can see, can be manifested in systemic hypotension. On the pulmonary side, you can have a, a significant acute decrease in pulmonary blood flow and associated both small and large airway obstruction, which leads to this rigid chest that's so difficult to sort out when you come to the bedside. This results in increased dead space ventilation and increased VQ mismatching, both resulting in hypoxia and respiratory acidosis, and that too feeds the fire, so to speak, in terms of increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance. So this cascade needs to be broken by an acute, um, thoughtful intervention. So if your assessment is that it is in fact an acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, you want to hand ventilate with 100% oxygen. And if you have nitric oxide readily available at, at your center, then you want to blend that into the circuit and just hang in there. And as you break the cycle, then the chest will start to rise. And you're in the midst of what you think is a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. Are you going to put this patient on 80 parts per million of nitric oxide, 20 parts per million? Where are you starting? I, I, will, I will generally start at 40 parts per million. I think um, there's animal data suggesting that the maximum was 80, as you know. But the, the incidence of methemoglobinemia is significant at, at that dose. So that's, that's no longer used. Um, there's some... There's not a lot, great deal of human data to guide us here, but in general, I think you can potentially get um, more from 40 parts per million than 20 parts per million, but I wouldn't go beyond that. So I think 40 parts per million is a reasonably safe dose. And then once there's a response, I rarely stay on 40 parts per million. I'll generally get down to 20 parts per million rather quickly. And um, if you're making progress, are you using uh, end tidal CO2 amplitude to see improvement in pulmonary flow? What, what's guiding you uh, at the bedside, uh, breath to breath and uh, beat to beat? I think end tidal CO2 is helpful. I think the, the, the feel of the chest rising is helpful. As the compliance improves, your, your circulation is probably improving. Obviously, saturation is helpful. And then because what you're dealing with is an is not just an elevation in pulmonary arterial pressure, but what makes it an acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis is that the RV is acutely failing, impinging upon the LV and impeding your output. You will start to see, as, as the RV gets better, the LV output improves, so you'll, that'll be reflected in an increase in your systemic arterial pressure. And um, so, you know, uh, you may or may not be making improvement. Uh, let's say that it doesn't appear that you are. Uh, patients may be not deteriorating further, but you're clearly not moving out of this. You're concerned that the RV is still under stress. What are you adding next? What are you doing next? I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to add a lot of things beyond pulmonary vasodilator therapy in the very acute setting. But if you've broken this, this spell, and, and again, you want to give 100% oxygen. You want to make them alkalotic, so that can most quickly be accomplished with hyperventilation and achieving hypocarbia, but you can also give bicarbonate to, to help you with that. Um, and then inhaled nitric oxide. Once you've broken that spell, I think then you can reassess and not only add some more pulmonary vasodilator therapy, but also give agents to try to support both the right and the left heart, depending on the particular circumstances. Can I press you? Um, what's the harm of saying, you know, I want to add an inotrope now? I'm concerned this RV is uh, really, you know, in fulminant failure. Um, and, you know, now's the time to add in an inotrope. Um, any harm in that? 
uh, low dose epinephrine, uh, dopamine at uh, 10 mics per kilo per minute. Certainly there is now a role for considering the use of vasoactive or inotropic support. First, let's not forget about um, optimizing preload in this situation to the right ventricle, which, as you know, in the acute situation may involve volume loading, but often in the subacute or chronic situation, it involves diuresis of the right ventricle. CVP monitoring can be extremely helpful in this situation to guide your volume management. And as I should have brought up when we were talking about acute pulmonary hypertensive crises, CVP monitoring or monitoring by atrial pressure can be extremely helpful in one, identifying a pulmonary hypertensive crisis where you'd expect this, the right atrial pressure to be elevated and also to guide your therapy where you would expect right atrial pressure to be decreasing as your pulmonary hypertensive crisis is being broken. In terms of inotropes, you know that there are several options and decisions are often made based on their effect on cardiac output as well as their effect on the peripheral vasculature, both the pulmonary and the systemic vasculature. As you can see, there's data on the effects of several agents on cardiac output and vascular resistance, but please keep in mind when they're talking about the inotropic effects of these drugs, oftentimes these things have been studied on the left ventricular contractility as opposed to the right ventricular contractility. Also keep in mind that in terms of the vasodilating or vasoconstricting effects of the vasculature, that the effect of a particular agent may be influenced by a variety of factors because the receptors that they activate are either upregulated or downregulated by a variety of factors, including how long they've been on these medications, the presence or absence of sepsis, their nutritional status, et cetera. So the bottom line is you start one of these medications on a particular patient, and you must observe closely to see what the particular effects are on your patient. You should also realize that the effect of these vasoactive agents on the peripheral vasculature is often tone dependent. In other words, if the vasculature is in a very dilated state, the chances that one of these agents will further dilate it is minimal. But some general principles when selecting an inotropic agent are, one, avoid agents that would increase pulmonary vascular resistance in this situation. Although you can argue that concomitant use of selective pulmonary vasodilators like inhaled nitric oxide and 100% oxygen would likely offset the pulmonary vasoconstricting effects of most agents. You should certainly avoid tachycardia um, because tachycardia can certainly um, hurt your right ventricular output and increase uh, myocardial oxygen consumption of the RV. And avoid systemic vasodilation if possible, particularly in the setting of a dilated right ventricle, because as you know, that can really um, negatively impact RV-LV interactions. And so, Jeff, you've uh, stabilized the patient as you've described with 100% oxygen, nitric oxide through hand ventilation, uh, alkali therapy, um, and yet the patient's still having episodes three, four, five hours later. We've all had these patients where you've stabilized initially, but now episodes of acute desaturation associated with systolic hypotension. You're obviously still brittle. The RV is still under severe strain. RV dysfunction is still a concern. What are therapies you know, three, four, and five in your armamentarium? So this is somewhat of a stylistic choice. But before I give you the, the treatment options, I would say that you must always think about, is there something that we're missing? So if the cause of the pulmonary hypertension is clear, for example, it's a, it's a VSD that was operated on a little bit older and is now in the perioperative period where it's very clear um, what's going on, then I don't think further diagnostic evaluation is necessary. But depending on the situation, if, if you should always think about, is there something that's missing, that, could be, that we're missing, that could be contributing, that we need to know about? And so the potential for diagnostic evaluation should always be thought about. Having said that, in the acute setting, I think in terms of adding pulmonary vasodilator therapy in, in a mecha intubated, mechanically ventilated patient, I think utilizing iloprost in addition to the nitric oxide is a, is, a, is a nice touch. It's selective, again, so you don't have to worry about the systemic hypotension. And as we 
alluded to with the left ventricle, if anything, we want the systemic vascular resistance to be a bit on the high side to help the right ventricle, left ventricular interdependence. Um, and it works via cyclic AMP activation, where inhaled nitric oxide works via cyclic GMP activation. So at least theoretically, there may be some additive effect where one patient cast, if, if the, the one cascade may be perturbed more than the other in a particular patient, you may see uh, one benefit more than the other. So I like to add iloprost. Um, and it can be nebulized into the airway through the ventilator. It has to be given quite frequently, but in, you're in the ICU, so it's not as big an issue. So um, I would add uh, acutely, in addition to nitric oxide, I'd add uh, iloprost therapy. And then I would give something to support the heart. If, uh, if um, I generally give milrinone as, as an inotropic and lucitropic agent, um, and then again, though, depending on the, how dilated the right ventricle is, we may also add a vasoconstrictor like vasopressin to uh, support systemic vascular resistance. Since a lot, of, some of the cardiac output problem is the fact that the RV is dilated and impinging upon the LV, and that the, the output of the RV is somewhat LV dependent, as you know that if you can utilize a vasoconstrictor like norepinephrine, I, we like to use vasopressin because it doesn't have any pulmonary vasoconstricting effects, just systemic. If you tighten up systemic vascular resistance, you could potentially get that LV to be a little bit bigger and improve the ventricular interactions and thereby improve output. Obviously, your LV has to be a good functioning LV when the right ventricle is not impinging upon it. But if inherently there's no disease in the left ventricle, then it can be a very helpful um, therapeutic modality when you're, when you're really struggling with severe RV dysfunction and that's impinging on the left ventricle. And then obviously diuresis can help out in subacutely in, um, for the right ventricle. But when, when you talk about inotropes for the right ventricle, you bring up a very important um, area. I think investigation and therapeutic targeting for pulmonary hypertension over the last couple of decades, which has been terrific, has appropriately focused on the pulmonary vasculature and the potential endothelial injury and mechanisms of the smooth muscle remodeling. And because of that work, there are several new drugs and many new drugs which, which target the vascular proliferation that are, that are down the pike and I think will we'll come to human trials soon. And that's very exciting. However, as you know, ultimately, this becomes a disease of right heart dysfunction and failure. And in terms of long-term survival for these patients with the chronic forms of pulmonary hypertension, it's really their right ventricular dynamics that are the best predictors of outcome as opposed to their pulmonary dynamics. In other words, it's not how high their pulmonary vascular resistance is, but indices of right ventricular function, including right atrial pressure, are better predictors of long-term survival. So appropriately, in parallel with these, these exciting investigations of pulmonary vascular mechanisms of disease, there's we're learning new insights about the right ventricle. And we realize, similar to it's hard to take an adult medication and say it's going to work in a child, it's not appropriate to say a medication that works for the left ventricle is going to work for the right ventricle. Because as you know, they come from different developmental origins. Their muscle fiber orientation is very different. And the mechanisms in which they contract are very different. So we utilize drugs that improve the inotropic state of the heart, but we really don't have drugs that work effectively for the right ventricle. So understanding the mechanisms of adaptive and maladaptive right ventricles, why some patients' right ventricle seems to work much longer and better than others, whether it's a genetic predisposition predisposition or what are the, the mechanisms of that, of that adaptation are really a, 
an interesting area of a new investigation that I think will get us targeting therapies for the right ventricle that may imp have a significant impact on these patients' lives. Well, uh, Dr. Jeff Feynman, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful overview of pulmonary hypertension and um, also for uh, telling us how you approach these problems in San Francisco. Thank you. What an honor to be here. Thanks very much.